All who thirst, come to the water. Come, all who are weary. Come, all who yearn for forgiveness. The Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, has washed over us, and our gracious and holy God beckons and blesses us. Drink deeply of these living waters. Let us worship this God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Some of you may be sitting in your pajamas and drinking a cup of coffee and enjoying that. I hope you are. But nevertheless, uh, we're thankful for the opportunity to have uh, technology that enables us, even in difficult times, uh, to worship together. And uh, I pray and so, I'm so thankful for the Spirit of God to be with us uh, in a special way that enables us to worship even in this way. And since we believe that the Lord God is with us always through the person of the Holy Spirit, we can receive the Lord's blessing even where we are, sitting right in our homes. And so we receive his greeting today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for bringing us together in this difficult time. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love and your mercy. The Lord greets you, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ through the presence of his Holy Spirit and all of the Lord's people said, Amen. Amen. A reading from Ephesians 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Still. 
Friends, as we continue our time of worship this morning, uh, the, the president had declared a national day of prayer regarding uh, this coronavirus, uh, everything associated with it, uh, the sickness itself, uh, the fear and the hysteria and the panic that has been caused in it, uh, the worrying uh, people being out of work for a period of time because of things closing, schools closing, uh, and we decided that we really needed to include uh, a time of prayer uh, specifically for this. And so uh, we have some people who have sort of volunteered uh, to offer up prayers alongside me as well. Uh, and so if you're at home uh, watching this, doesn't matter even if you're watching it 10 weeks from now, uh, you can offer up prayers uh, in regards to what the Lord is doing. Uh, and, and I just thank you in advance for that. But uh, let's go to God uh, in a time of prayer. Father God, you are Lord over all things. And we know that that is true as Christians, but sometimes we need to be reminded of it. And in the midst of this difficulty with this virus and all of the things that come alongside it, Lord, we are in a special time of needing that reminder. And our nation in this world is in a special time of needing to see the power of God. And so, Lord, we would just love to spend some time lifting up petitions, praises, heartaches, thanksgivings for all that is going on to the God who is the Lord of our whole universe. Lord, in your word, you have said to cast all your our cares upon you because you do care for us. Yes. So we come to you today laying everything before you yes. in this uncertainty and in this chaos that we feel around us. We know that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are sovereign and you reign. So we ask you in this time to be with our nation and in the world, and to show your power. Thank you for being a God to us. Lord, we thank you too for providing for us in the United States with a president who really wants to do what's right, who has not politicized this at all. And we thank you too for the fact that he surrounded himself with many, many experts who are doing their best to eliminate this disease, or at least to minimize it. Lord, I want to pray for all of the doctors and the officials who are working hard at trying to slow this virus down. And we pray, Lord, that the virus may be defeated. We pray, Lord, for the elderly who seem very susceptible to this disease. We pray, Lord, that uh, they may stay healthy and that the measures that are being taken may be good measures, saving measures. Lord, we pray, too, for those people who have the disease. We pray that you will bless them we pray that you will save them. We pray that people may look back to you as uh, one, of, one of the officials said today, we need to get back to God. And we need to pray and lift, lift this country up in prayer. Lord, we pray for the, the families who have lost loved ones. There aren't a lot yet, but there could be a lot more. And so we pray for all of those who have lost loved ones and who will lose loved ones. We just pray for them and hold them up before you. And we want to pray this in Jesus' name. Lord, we want to pray for the day today. I pray for all of the families that are affected in the coming weeks 
by no school being in session, for having to love their kids every day, all day, and for especially the, the moms who work or the single parents who work and, and now are scrambling to find a place for their kids to be loved and cared for. Lord, I pray for them that this will be a time not so much of fear, but a time when you give them extra time together. And I pray for families to be strengthened through this, for your spirit to be at work in families. I pray for those who are dealing with tragedies of many kinds, who, who then have coronavirus to worry about on top of it. And I just pray for a deep peace for them. And I pray for the people of our community around West Leonard Church, that especially in this time, they will see and hear about you and that their faith will be awakened, that our faith will be awakened, God, as we depend on you more. And may our faith be a light. May our words and our witness through this bring glory to you. In Jesus' name. Lord God, we lift up all of these petitions and many others. And, and Lord, even if there are people listening or watching this video, uh, their hearts are praying as well, Lord, that every Christian it says that our, the, in the word that the spirit inside us groans even when we don't know what to pray, Lord. And I just thank you that the Holy Spirit that dwells within your body uh, is powerfully at work uh, lifting up petitions even when we cannot find the words. Lord, we pray against the spirit of fear that is in our society, uh, Lord, that there is only one fear that is good, and that is a fear of the Lord. Uh, and we pray against that, Lord, that people would recognize that you are God, you are Lord, and that we can trust you with all things, even in difficult circumstances, even when someone is sick, that, Lord, your love and your hand is with them. And Lord, we pray for healing and we pray for preservation of life. And we pray for your power and goodness to be known. Lord, cause us to be diligent in our behaviors. To keep from spreading this. To be diligent in our prayers. To be diligent in our witness to you. That the world would know, even in the midst of this mess, that you are glorious and awesome and wonderful. Lord, comfort us and give us boldness in this difficult time. Lord, we pray all of these things and many others in the name of our wonderful Lord, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Well, friends, the Spirit of the Lord is with us all the time, and we're so thankful for uh, our Sunday mornings, whether they're apart uh, or whether we're together, that, that the Lord gives us a time of worship, a time to reflect on all He has done, to get into His Word and be fed and grown uh, in, into the people that He calls us to be. And uh, nothing will stop uh, us from doing that. We pursue the Lord with an insistence, uh, with a desire, with a passion. Uh, and I just thank you for those who are tuning in uh, to, to listen to this and be a part of this uh, and to participate in your prayers uh, and at home. Uh, get comfortable. We're getting into God's Word. I'm so excited about what He's going to be uh, showing us today. Uh, as we continue the sermon series that we've been going on, uh, the in Step with the Spirit, where we've been looking at growing in a relationship with uh, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity who dwells in us, and he comes upon us in power to equip us for kingdom work. Uh, and we're so thankful for that. And I, I just continue to hear the stories of how uh, we're growing in cooperation. And, and even doing this service, the way that we're doing it, is us growing in cooperation with what he is doing uh, to ensure uh, that the kingdom work is being done uh, no matter what the world might throw at us. Uh, and so uh, we're going to be getting into that. But before we get into uh, the message today, which will be from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 31, let's go to God in just a brief prayer of enlightenment and ask His Spirit. And do this at home. Invite His Spirit to come upon you and work. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for what you're about to do. Thank you for the community of faith at West Leonard Church, whether we are together in person or together in spirit. Each one of us has the spirit of the Lord upon them and in them to enable us to hear your voice today. And that's what we've come together for. And that's why we seek you to hear your voice so that your kingdom would be built. Lord, we pray that you would speak loud and clear to each and every one of us. For our circumstances and our situation, that you have a word for each and every person here today. And we thank you for that word in advance. We pray all of this in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 31. If you've got your Bible at home and you're welcome to open it up, or if you're watching this on the computer and you've got another tab to bring it up on your browser, you're welcome to do that as well. We'll be cutting off the very tail end that kind of goes into the next section, so don't be surprised if we stop short of the end of 31. But uh, just kind of a funny fact, um, and if you've used this, don't feel any condemnation whatsoever. Uh, but 1 Corinthians 13 is sort of this passage, this chapter that is always read at weddings about love. Uh, and ironically, that, that love that's talked about in 13 is really the foundation of what Paul is saying here in regards to spiritual gifts. Uh, and if you've been with us through the sermon series, whether online, uh, and if you're new for whatever reason, this is the first thing you're hearing, you can actually go back on our website and, and listen to those. Uh, but we, when we were talking about the ways we cooperate with the Spirit, one of the things that we looked at was that we grow in a love for God, a love for our neighbors, and a love uh, reciprocating uh, or receiving God's love uh, for ourselves as well. And that love is the foundation of spiritual gifts, which is the subject uh, that we're going to be looking at today. So I'm just going to read through the whole chapter, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or another you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, 
but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. And to another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. And to another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the Spirit to drink, even so that the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If there were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, these, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, Second, prophets. Third, teachers. Then, miracles. Then, different kinds of gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts. It's the word of our awesome God. Thanks be to God. There are some people interceding uh, for me right now, in case you're wondering uh, who that is, and they're allowed to pray and, and do that as well. Uh, but when you look at the early church, it grew like wildfire, seemingly out of nowhere. And the reason it was able to do that is because the Holy Spirit, which was given to all believers, was working powerfully in the world and amongst the believers. And we've talked about a lot of different examples of how the Holy Spirit was working. He was guiding them and he was giving them love for the broken and love for God. And they were in relationship with him and they were seeking him in prayer, interceding for the world, asking God, inviting God to do the impossible. And one of the ways the Spirit was working was through the giving of supernaturally given gifts. 
spiritual gifts. And this section that we just read today is perhaps one of the largest sections or the most complete sections that the Bible talks about spiritual gifts. Paul is writing to a church that had a number of different challenges. Uh, and one of the things they seemingly have, he starts off and he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. I don't want you to lack understanding. I don't want it to be something that you struggle with. And so he spends some time, Paul spends some time instructing them on the importance of and the nature of these spiritual gifts that God was giving to his church to enable them to do things that they could not do in their own power. And there are a lot of different things described here and in other places of Scripture. Some of the gifts that are talked about seem somewhat ordinary in nature. Like something that you could do on your own, even without the help of the Spirit. And that even non-Christians are capable of doing. And yet, they were extraordinarily empowered. Gifts of encouragement. Gifts of giving. Gifts of sharing and comforting and encouraging one another. And still other gifts that are talked about throughout Scripture and in this passage are gifts that are extraordinary in nature. They're supernatural. They're miraculous. It says miraculous signs. That's like a really broad category. There could be all kinds of things in that, right? That there were gifts of healing. There were miracles happening. And there were speaking in tongues. And then there were people who could could understand that language the person was speaking and share with others, and prophecies and visions. There were all kinds of spiritual gifts happening, things that were sort of natural but divinely empowered in nature, and other things that were supernatural, that were just un un things that people couldn't do in their own flesh. They couldn't do it in their own power. And Paul says here, all of these gifts have a common source, they have a common direction and purpose, and they all ultimately are part of what God is doing. Paul says that their source is the Spirit. There is one Holy Spirit, and every kind of gift, no matter what it is, comes from that Spirit. And that all of those gifts are used to be a part of the body of Christ, this group of people called Christians that are advancing the kingdom work. The body of Christ was given the task of growing the kingdom, of making new disciples, of showing the world the glory of God. And all of these gifts together are united in that purpose. One spirit gives many different kinds of gifts that all lead towards one purpose. And because they find their oneness in the person of the Holy Spirit, they are all of incredible value, and they are all called to be something they grow in. The end of our passage we read here, it says, Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. That can be understood a couple of different ways. As asking for new gifts that they don't have yet, or asking the giftings they have to grow and become greater. And I, for one, am a fan of understanding, and this is all of the above, that the gifts of the Spirit would become greater and greater among the church. Paul and the other teachers of the New Testament, the writers of the New Testament, wanted it to be clear. The gifts of the Spirit were essential. They all came from the Spirit of God, and they all went towards the purposes that God had. In this series, we've been talking about the importance of growing in our walk with the Spirit. That we're called to be in relationship with God, and that includes God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we've been talking about ways that we can be more intentional about growing in the Spirit of God of giving Him control of our life, of cooperating with Him for the kingdom-building work. And we've talked about a lot of different things that do that. And one of them that we need to talk about today, and perhaps I would say the one that people are maybe the most familiar with, is that of spiritual gifts. The work of building the church and growing disciples is impossible. It can't be done. Unless the God of the impossible partners with his people as the promise of scripture is and works with us 
to accomplish things that we can never accomplish in our own flesh, in our own strength. And everything we see in the Christian faith for 2,000 years, in the building that we come to church in, or just Christians all over the world, is the result of a God who has given spiritual gifts to people and then used those people, cooperating with Him, using those gifts to advance His kingdom. Now as we talk about this, we need to be careful that we don't believe that this is somehow a passive thing. Like God just gives us the gifts and then we're just sort of along with the ride because Scripture talks about the importance of growing. Paul here is saying don't be ignorant of it. And if he says don't be ignorant of it, it means that it's possible to sort of have spiritual gifts or be growing in spiritual gifts but not really understand how to use them, not really understand how to grow in them, or maybe not see the importance Scripture talks about grieving the Spirit. Sort of walking with the Spirit, but doing it in a way that isn't good. It talks about quenching the Holy Spirit. One analogy I've heard used for quenching the Holy Spirit. It's like if the Holy Spirit is supposed to flow in and through you to accomplish God's purpose, it's like a hose that you kink up to walk to the other side of the garden so you don't get water everywhere. And the fact that the Bible says these things is important because it means that we need to be wary of them. It's easy for us to maybe have certain spiritual gifts that we're, we're not comfortable with and we're not willing to submit to God on. Or we think we're a little strange or maybe we're not willing to celebrate. And if we look at this passage today, we'd see Paul saying all of the parts of the body are important. All of the gifts and each person in the body, each with their own gifts and their own empowerments, is critical to God's work in this world. So let's talk about what kind of gifts there can be and... Boy, this is a long section. I'm just going to go ahead and say that right now. In fact, I'm a little bit thankful that it's, you know, we're doing it online so I can hold you a little bit longer, okay? If you have to pause the video and you come right back, you sure can. But we need to talk about spiritual gifts. And to be frank, we can't go through them exhaustively. But I'm going to touch on a couple different categories that help us to kind of understand what kinds of spiritual gifts there are. And my hope is in the future to do some teaching, some more teaching on spiritual gifts and be able to get maybe into some of the nitty gritties of some specific ones that are identified in Scripture. But um, I've been talking about this book, Growing the Church and the Power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it sort of categorizes these into three different categories. And um, I want to look at those and sort of uh, talk about why they're important and, and how we should understand them. The first category is uh, what they refer to in that book as functional gifts, functional gifts of the Spirit. Functional gifts of the Spirit can seem relatively ordinary in nature, and yet, while they may seem incredibly ordinary, they are critical to the kingdom work. The analogy I like to use with functional gifts is they're like your thumbs. Thumbs are relatively simple mechanically. There's not a whole lot of complexity. I, I dare, I have to be careful about saying that about the body and the way the Lord is put together. But your thumb is a relatively simple construction, and yet without your thumbs, things are a lot harder. Things are a lot more complicated. Because while it may seem relatively normal and unassuming, it's this appendage, it's your thumb, that makes us fundamentally different than so many animals in the world and gives us capabilities that they don't have. Gifts, functional gifts, are like that. They may seem ordinary, they may seem somewhat unassuming, and yet they are critical to the life of the church and they're critical to the growing of the kingdom. I'm going to give just a few examples. That scripture gives comforting and encouraging. We live in a busted world. We're experiencing some of that brokenness for ourselves right now. If you're watching this right when it's being posted with the coronavirus and the fear and anxiety that our world is filled with. And the ability to comfort and encourage one another is something that many of us are practicing right now. And and with people we know, whether they're Christians or non-Christians. And the scripture says that that is a gift from God. And it may seem relatively ordinary. And it may seem like something you just do. It's just the natural thing to do. 
But the scripture says that God, through the Holy Spirit, empowers that to be supernaturally enabled. And that is incredibly good news in a time when sometimes we don't know what to say, or we don't know how to comfort, or we feel like anything we could say will not be enough. The word of the Lord says that through the Holy Spirit, the spiritual gift of comfort and encouraging, while it may seem ordinary, is critically important to what the Lord is doing in his kingdom building work. Giving is another example of that. The Lord has simply blessed some people, whether it's through finances or maybe it's through the ability to raise funds or, or to just help generate resources in some way. And the scripture says that giving is a gift. And it's a gift used for the kingdom purposes. And it may seem normal. And if you're a churchgoer and you tithe regularly or you give to offerings regularly or give to charity regularly, it may seem like, well, this is just something I do because I'm a good person. But the word says that it's a spirit-empowered gift that everything we give has God's power behind it. That is awesome news. That is so good to hear that this relatively ordinary thing that just seems like, well, it's part of being in a church is actually part of how God gifts us and enables us to serve him. Serving is another great example. The church is largely led by volunteers or whether it's an example of whether you're at home and, or a friend needs help with something and you're able to help in a relatively ordinary way, but nevertheless, it is a spiritual gift that you have to offer to the Lord. Second category of gifts. Leadership gifts are something that the scripture talks about that are used specifically with giving direction and movement to God's kingdom purposes. It is one thing to have a lot of believers together all with different gifts. It is another thing to have people who have been gifted in a special way to help organize and direct the work of God for his kingdom purposes. To help people know where to point that spiritual gift at and how to use it. In Ephesians chapter 4, we see a list of five of them and certainly not the only spiritual gifts. And I need to say this very briefly about it. Just because you're not in leadership in a church or in leadership in an organization doesn't mean that you don't have gifts of leadership. Because leadership gifts... While they may equip us for those positions of leadership, they are nevertheless a critical part of how we do everyday work. Many, many people in the body of Christ have gifts of leadership, not just elders and deacons and people in charge of ministries. Ephesians 4 identifies five, talks about apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Apostles is one that sometimes we get a little hung up on because we think about Jesus' apostles, the select group of people. And while we certainly believe that that group of people had a tremendous and important place in the history and in the foundation of the church, the word apostle means sent one, one who is sent. Timothy is referred to in the Greek as an apostle at one point, and Jesus is referred to by the word apostle even at another point. Apostle is a function as well as an office. And while we might recognize that that office of apostle had a special place in history, nevertheless, we believe that the functions and the work of the ap apostolic ministry is not over. Apostles give direction to the church, push the church forward, move us towards God's purposes, and give leadership overall. Prophets are people who hear from God in special ways, whether it's through reading the word or even getting, we'll talk about some supernatural gifts sometimes that came through supernatural means and are able to communicate God's will and purposes to the life of the body. Evangelists are people who help cement people in the beginnings of their faith. They have a special gift for mission, a gift for helping introduce people to the Lord as people begin to come into the kingdom, they find places for them and they help to cement them in. We think about the office of pastor, a special office, and it doesn't just mean because I'm a pastor that that means, well, that's what the pastoral office is, but pastoring is a gift 
of coming alongside people in struggle, of helping people to navigate the difficulties of sin and hardship in their life. Pastors are caregivers. They care for the flock. And many, many people, even if you don't have an MDiv, have a gift of being a pastor. And then there's teachers, people who help to explain God's word, people who help to apply God's word, who have a way with words of communicating that to people of all different kinds. And there are other gifts as well, but this is just a sampling of that, leadership gifts. The last kind of gifts, and probably the ones that are the most controversial, are what that book uh, that I referenced calls manifestational gifts. And manifestational gifts are largely supernatural in nature. They are sometimes miraculous. They go beyond understanding, very often beyond human reason. And their purpose is to demonstrate the power and glory of God. Scripture tells us that the reason for God's miracles, among others, one of the main reasons is to show the world how powerful he is. To show the world how good it is. And manifestational gifts have oftentimes been the ones that people are critical of because they, are, they haven't experienced them for themselves. Or maybe they've seen examples of people who fraudulently use these gifts. Or maybe they've They've just struggled with believing that these things can be true. These things can be real. But I ask you, as you're listening to this, do you want to see the glory of God and the power of God demonstrated to this world? Well, the word says that these gifts are especially potent at doing that. Yes, all of the gifts of the Spirit do that, but these gifts are specially appointed for that. We hear about supernatural gifts of wisdom and knowledge. People being able to get insight into situations sometimes they couldn't possibly have that speaks into a situation. The gift of faith. This is different than just being a believer. This is a gift of sort of a contagious faith. When you meet that Christian that their faith kind of freaks you out a little bit. I love to meet Christians like that. That they just intimidate me just a little bit, but their faith is so on fire for God. It just, it's just so wild to see. And there's something about it that inspires other people to deep faith. There's a gifting of faith. Miraculous signs, and there are lots of different subcategories of that. Healings, people having visions, prophetic words, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues, and many things even beyond that. The gift of being able to perceive and understand and discern spiritual realities. If you've been along for this ride, we just talked about discernment last week. How do you know the difference between the things that God is leading us into by the Holy Spirit and the things that maybe the enemy is trying to sneak into our lives? And some people are especially gifted at discerning those things and being able to understand them. I'm going to say, I'm going to give a testimony about this, the speaking in tongues thing in just a little bit. All of these gifts and many others, and there is a, there's so many more that we can talk about. The scripture says they're all good. They're all from the same Lord, and they all go towards the same purpose. And we need to be careful to recognize and celebrate these gifts as we're called to celebrate. As we're called to follow the Lord and use those gifts for His purposes. And maybe you've been a person who, there's certain gifts you said, ah, I just don't know about that, or we don't need that kind of gift in the church, or maybe that's just for another time, but we have to be careful of what the Word of God says about all these gifts. They're all part of the body of Christ, they're all part of the family of believers, and they are all for the purpose of glorifying God, and we thank God. The Lord for those. We need to grow with that posture of thanksgiving to the Lord for those. What are some things we can do to grow specifically in this? And understandably so, this whole sermon series has been uh, sort of a, a, a 101 class. Just sort of touching the surface on some of these subjects. And certainly we could teach a lot more. But what are some basic things we can do to start growing as individuals and as church in spiritual gifts? 
The first thing is we need to foster an attitude of excitement and acceptance for all spiritual gifts. Recognizing that they're all part of what God is going to do. And even things that seem a little bit strange to us at first, or a little bit out of the ordinary, or maybe we're even a little bit uncomfortable with, we need to recognize that God sometimes calls us to things that are a little uncomfortable. He calls us to things that are a little bit strange, and yet they're good. They're good. They're from the Lord. Scripture says it's good. Now I'm going to give that testimony about speaking in tongues, like I said. Now, I want to start off by saying I've never spoken in tongues. One time I thought I might, and I thought I might have stifled it. I thought I might have quenched the Holy Spirit a little bit, but it didn't happen one way or another. Who knows? Maybe that was the case, but I want to tell a brief testimony about this. I was, uh, some years ago, uh, I was at a New Year's Eve party, and uh, not a Christian thing, just a just good time together with some friends and family, and among us there was someone who had just gone through a tremendous loss, and they were hurting a great deal, and so we decided, me and uh, three other brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as that person, decided we wanted to spend some time praying for them and with them. And so we went to a little back room in this party. This wasn't in a worship service. This was just in a, in a room where people's coats were on the bed. And we began to pray for healing and for God's hand and comfort upon them. And as we were praying, one of these people, there was a husband and wife sort of team and then me and another, another woman. And... This husband and wife, the husband began to speak in tongues. Now, I wasn't totally affront to it. I wasn't totally bothered by it. But I didn't, I wasn't really sure about this whole thing. You know, okay, so he speaks in tongues. And here he is, he's praying in tongues. And, and, and okay, so we'll pray and we're just going to let him pray in tongues. And as he began to pray in tongues, I can only tell you what happened. I can't explain what happened. I began to hear in my heart and in my head in English... What he was saying out loud in tongues. Now, at first I thought to myself, well, this is my imagination. This is just God giving me words. And I, and I wasn't totally in doubt of what it was. But it was just something I'd never experienced before. It was like remembering. It's hard to describe. I didn't hear it in with my ears. But it's like remembering something someone said. It was in my heart, in my head, and I was hearing it in English. It was very specific. There, there were, they were talking about angels and, and, and water pouring out from heaven. So very specific imagery and stuff being said. And I said, okay, this is just, it is what it is. This is a bit strange. But what happened was that made it really extraordinary was when his wife, who I did not know, was gifted in interpreting tongues, began to speak in English out loud the very same words that I was hearing in my heart, word for word. It was absolutely extraordinary. Now, it's never happened to me since and in other situations where someone has been speaking in tongues, but for a moment, the Lord had come upon me through the Spirit in a special way that I would understand and be able to interpret tongues, and I didn't even know that that was happening. This wasn't at a worship service where I was worked up into an emotional frenzy. This is just in a back coat room somewhere praying for God to bring his healing hand. And I've got other stories like that, and I could take the liberty and recognize we're doing this online and just keep you here all day, but my intercessors will probably fall asleep on me. But the Lord really does want us to have an attitude of acceptance. And we might say, well, you know, the Lord might not pour out that gift on you, but what if he pours it out on someone else and it became something, are you willing to accept it and willing to say the Lord's word affirms this and we ought to affirm this? Or are you willing to have a heart that says, I would be willing to say yes. It says eagerly desire the greater gifts. Say, Lord, pour out more. Which of course is really the second part of this. Growing in a posture where we say, Lord, more. My friends, God is not shy to pour out his blessings on us. God is not shy to say, let me equip you more for the kingdom purposes. There is nothing that he has made available to us that we cannot ask for and that we should not ask for. In my personal experience, what will happen is you say, Lord, give me gifts for service. And you pray that and you seek him in prayer for that. And what will happen maybe is he'll give you one. 
And then you use that and you exercise it and you're faithful with the gift he has given you in using it for the kingdom work and for the body of Christ, for growing us up into maturity. Then when you get used to that one, you might get another one too. Who knows? Maybe your experience will differ and he'll just pour out all the spiritual gifts and you'll be wonderfully overwhelmed by all that God can do. We need to create opportunities to use these. And oftentimes leadership gifts we are able to create and uh, gifts, uh, opportunities to use and, and functional gifts we're able to give opportunities. And maybe it's harder sometimes to create opportunities for some of these manifestational or empowering or supernatural gifts. But nevertheless, we as a church and as individuals sort of create opportunities for the spirit to move and flow through us and do powerful stuff. We also need more practical teaching on spiritual gifts, and I guess that's on me to add that to the many repertoire, the, the, the long list of things that I say, we're going to preach more on that someday, and then sometimes it's a little difficult to get to that, or we don't get to that in a certain time. But we did eventually get to this Holy Spirit stuff, so the Lord is faithful in that. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, spiritual gifts are an incredibly important way that we interact with the Holy Spirit. And it's not just something we're along for the ride. It is something we interact with. It's something we seek God to fill us with more, to grow us in. We seek God's direction of being more faithful in using the spiritual gifts, in celebrating them amongst each other. And as we do those things, God's spirit will become closer and closer to us and will become more and more aware of his presence as we cooperate with the spiritual gifts that he is giving us. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, and he says this. He says, those who come to him, there will be waters of living, of life coming out of them. And by this, it says in the Gospel, that he meant the Spirit. And the Spirit of God is meant to flow from us, to change the world, to transform the world around us, and to show the world God's glory. And it happens in one way, in one powerful way, through God giving us spiritual gifts. Won't you join me in a time of prayer? Father God, thank you so much for all that you're doing. Lord, you have given us a great plethora of spiritual gifts. You have given us so many different things for your kingdom purposes. And Lord, we ask right now, even, even if we're at home, Lord, maybe just pray, Lord, grow us in gifts. Fill us up. Give us empowerment for kingdom ministry. Lord, we want to be effective witnesses for you. And that means growing in spiritual gifts. And it means growing in an acceptance of what you're doing and what you can do. Lord, may we never quench the Spirit. May we never grieve the Spirit. May we walk in a willingness to submit ourselves to everything that you do. Lord, thank you for all your accomplishing. Thank you for your good and gracious work. We pray all this in Jesus' awesome name. Amen.
body of Christ all over the world, at home, in the present. May you go in the empowerment of gifts for the sake of the kingdom work. May you receive his awesome power in every way and may your heart be open to what he can do through you and his awesome gifts. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be ours forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.